Good evening, and welcome to episode 33 of Treasure Hunting for Nostalgia. This is Brandon. This is Brad. So let's just get in your face with some top five action. In your face, really fast. Uh, which one did you guys want to do first, books? Oh, we're doing two? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we're doing two top five this week, and the format will be a little different. Uh, let's do top five books right now. Number five, Rainbow Goblins. Never heard of it. Yes, you did. That was the only book that showed a naked butt in elementary school. Vaguely remember it. Exactly. (laughs) It's about rainbows and goblins, and there's a naked goblin butt, which was the first time I ever saw a naked butt. So that's why you have the craving for naked goblin butt in your face? Exactly. It's actually... A two part that and where the wild things are. Okay. <laughs> um, done? It's all needs to be said. <laughs> <laughs> my number five is going to have to be Berserk Volume One. Oh, I didn't put any mangas on my list. Um, I read it while I was in the uh, ER when I got diagnosed with Bell's palsy. I thought I had a stroke uh, because the whole right side of my face. I couldn't move it, and so that's the only thing that put my mind at ease was because I picked up that book and started reading it, and um, my number five. Do you still you don't have it, right? Have what number one? No. Okay, so it was my copy you read. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. So my number five is a book by a poker player named Gus Hansen. It's uh, the book is called Every Hand Revealed. Basically, it's a hand-by-hand breakdown of his win at the Aussie Millions World Poker Tour Tournament. He won uh, $1.2 million and beat out a field of 747 players. The book doesn't include every single hand. Um, a lot of it is, you know, just you just full pre-flop. It's not really that interesting to, to hear about that. But it pretty much tells the story of every significant hand that he played. Um, if you're at all familiar with Gus's style, you'll understand that Gus is a very loose, aggressive player. He likes to play a lot of hands. So um, I just really appreciate that he took the time to... Um, what he did was he had a little uh, recorder that he carried around with him. And after every hand, he just walked away from the table and recorded his thoughts on that hand. Wow. What he had to do is record you know, what his two cards were, what cards came out on the board, and exactly what he thought about you know how he what sort of process he he went through to make the decisions that he did what he thought other players had what he thought the other players were doing when they were either checking or betting or raising um it was it was a lot of work for him to do and it was really cool because he actually won the tournament so you actually hear you know everything from start to start to the end of the tournament it's a really cool read i wouldn't say that it's necessarily informative It's just really fun to read and kind of get his thoughts on how the game should be played. The two things that he really kind of focused on was um, attacking and being more aggressive once got introduced into the tournament. And the other one was about continuation betting. Basically, if you raise before the flop, you should almost always bet on the flop regardless of whether or not you hit your hand. So that's my other part of it. Every hand is built by Gus have to check that out. That sounds interesting. It's a fun. It's a really fun read. It's fast too. Hmm. Lots of pictures. Number four on my list is the Dirt, the Motley Crew book. Nice. Have you guys read that? I've read parts of it. It's crazy. Alvan, a friend, turned me on to it, and the, just the stuff that they do, not with themselves, but with uh, Ozzy Osbourne, and just all the crazy activities they would get in. It's nuts. It tells. Um, the the rise and fall of their band it talks about all the addictions of course and uh, what they did on these binge addictions and who they interacted with they brought in like slash and people who they lived in apartments with and how dirty it was and it's a uh, it's fun read but you're gonna like you, there's a lot of gross parts in it if you don't have the stomach for it don't read it like mm-hmm. gross how uh, like the contest that uh, one of them had with Ozzy Osbourne on who could be the grossest at the hotel. Uh, Ozzy, I believe, snorted a whole ant colony that were going back into the ant hill up his nose. Yeah. Uh, another one defecated on someone and then some put it in their mouth. Uh, 
it was it's just a lot of gross stuff. Wow. My number four is gonna have to be the Deathly Hollows. Okay. The last Harry Potter book. The only Harry Potter book you read? The only Harry Potter book I read. <laughs> <laughs> um, the the movie actually got a lot of the points right and a lot of the major parts in the movie were in the book. It, it was just fun oh. to read through it. Did you when you read it? Did you have a a cape on? With I a, had a blanket over me with the flashlight and a, a wizard wand. And, no, I didn't have the wizard wand. I was trying to replicate the never ending story mm-hmm. when he's reading it in the old school room. But that book ends. It does. All books have an ending. Not the never ending story. <laughs> <laughs> The the movie that that was done in two parts, right? Wasn't that two? They have two parts. Yeah, you know what? It sucks. It's good that they put two parts in it so they could tell a lot more of the story and not leave stuff out. But why wait a year to release them? Because they want to make money. All right, my number four is the the Odyssey by Homer. Uh, I read this in high school in Mr. Dryden's class. Uh, basically, the the plot for the Odyssey is about it's about this guy named Odysseus. He's the king of Ithaca. Uh, he sets off to fight in the Trojan Wars. Uh, after the fall of Troy, Odysseus uh, journeys home, and that's where most of the story takes place is during his journey home and when he actually gets home. Um, it takes him about ten years to get home uh, through through his travels. Uh, you hear stories about how the gods decide to do things for him and also do things to stop him on his journey. But all sorts of shit happens. I mean, there's sirens, there's cyclops, there's killer storms. There's all sorts of shit that happens to him, but I'm not going to go over all that. The, the coolest part about it is when he actually gets home. Uh, so as I said, he's the king of Ithaca. His wife, the queen, uh, Penelope, She's basically harassed by a bunch of suitors who are trying to take over Odysseus' estate because, like I said, it's been 10 years. They just assume that he's dead. So they're trying to court uh, Penelope so that he, they can take over his estate and essentially become the king of Ithaca. Uh, Odysseus also has a son. His name is um, T- Timoculus or something like that. T- Telemachus, that's what it is. And um, he's young. He lacks confidence, and he's probably not all that skilled because his father's been gone for ten years. So he never, he always wanted to, you know, get the suitors out of his house, but he never had the confidence or the skills to do it. So finally, when um, Odysseus does come home, the goddess Athena uh, disguises him as a beggar, and no one recognizes him. Not, none of the suitors recognize him, but there are a couple of people who do recognize him. One of them being his wife Penelope. So when Penelope recognizes him, she finally gives him to the suitor saying, okay, at this point, I'm, I'm done with this. I'm going to allow one of you to be my husband. All you got to do is string Odysseus's bow and, and shoot an arrow through, 12, through a maze of 12 axes. She's, she's putting this, this challenge forth knowing that Odysseus is there. He's in the guise of a beggar and that he's going to be the only one that can actually string the bow and, and complete this task. So all the suitors, they try and they fail, they try and they fail, and finally this beggar comes up and the suitors are just laughing at him because they just think he's some homeless dude. And he goes up there, he, he does everything, and then he reveals himself. Oh, man. And, and then shit gets real. Shit gets fucking real quick. So Telemachus, I, I believe that uh, before this happens, uh, Odysseus reveals himself to his son Telemachus and they kind of put a little plan together on, on how they're going to get rid of the suitors. So after he completes this task, he and Telemachus and a few of the uh, the loyal servants who have stayed loyal to him through uh, years and years of his absence uh, pick up arms and slay all the suitors. It's such a fucking righteous <laughs> ending to a boat. And of course, he, he ret- retains his throne as the king of Ithaca. So, <laughs> it wouldn't have been such a great ending if he just took off his robe and was like, it's me, I'm back, you guys can leave now. <laughs> <laughs> no, no way. <laughs> I call you guys must die. <laughs> I've been trying to find that movie forever too the with Armin Asante movie. Yeah, that's a cool movie. Did, and, um, do you check eBay? No. Oh, you probably find it. I've been trying to find it local because I don't watch it right now. But I've been trying for months to find it. So huh. I, I, in, in retrospect, I could have had it within a week. But yeah. um, they have a cool uh, on YouTube. They they match the Odyssey music video, the music score by Symphony X, with the movie. And you could watch the the 
them. And so at the end, on the last part, which is my favorite part, uh, Champion of Ithaca, when um, the his son Telemachus is like throwing spears and it's like impaling suitors to the wall, like he's always <laughs> strong. <laughs> it's such a fantastic music song and fantastic movie. He probably got heck at Ikari points. Hell he was angry. Hell <laughs> <laughs> he didn't have a meter. His was never ending. <laughs> Uh, let's see number three on my list is the Aragon books uh, those books I could read uh, w like it was hard not to stop reading them and that's a good book is when you don't want to put it down that was one of the few series that I have not put down I haven't read the last one yet I probably have to recap on like the first second and third because I think that he broke the third one up into two parts or something but they're just amazing books and they read like a role playing game number three What's the second one? Or how many are there? Uh, there's, oh. I think there's four now. Oh, really? There's Aragon, Eldest, Eldest, Eldest and then Brissinger, and I think that there's another one after that. My number three is going to have to be the whole Dragon Ball Z series. A psychotype. Uh, I have the most notes on this one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to lean back on this one. <laughs> uh, it's way better than the anime. It doesn't take half a season to beat one foe. Frieza Saka, I'm, I'm looking in your direction. <laughs> Dude, that's, that's like the full Frieza fight is one whole season, just Frieza by himself. And in the book, in the manga, it's like one volume. Yeah. Uh, also, Vegeta is the only one to excel during to attack Cell during the Kamehameha battle between Cell and Gohan. In the anime, everyone attacks Cell. You know when they're both like fighting and Gohan has broken off. Oh, I thought Piccolo was the only one that did it. It was Vegeta. Oh. It shows because uh, that that really dumbs down how dumbs down how Vegeta truly feels about Trunks because that's why Vegeta attacks Cell is to get revenge on Trunks. Oh, I thought it was his pride was on the line. No, his pride was way gone out the window by then. He got his ass beat so many times. Yeah. Um, they have nothing irrelevant. The whole tournament under the heavens. Sorry, Oli Boo and Pikuhan. Oh, no Snake Way. Uh, or the biggest waste of time, the false Namek riding Zapro. <laughs> this thoroughly confused me when I was little because I knew the Namek Dragon Balls were big, bigger than the Earth ones. And then in the anime, Gohan, Bulma, and Krillin go to the fake Namek. You don't know it's fake, and the, they're finding Earth Dragon Balls. And they're like, wait, I thought the, the Namek ones were bigger. But it comes to find out it's riding Zapro, two aliens who disguise this whole dream plan, plan thing to try to capture them. Fake Namek is revealed. Roddy and Zacro. Why did they do that? I, I think understand. I think they just wanted to leave that planet. They needed a spaceship, but I don't know why they went through the whole illusion thing. No, I, I'm, I'm talking to the, to the writers. Oh, okay. Why did they do that? that just, <laughs> just to add more episodes on to get more money? Probably. Biggest fucking waste of time is a fake Namek. I'm still waiting for the Roddy and Zacro DBZ CCG personalities, though. Yeah, they said they're too um, too good to be made. Yeah. So that was my number three. All right. So my number three is uh, by uh, is a graphic novel by Alan Moore called V for Vendetta. Uh, of course, there was a movie about this like 2006, 2007, mm -hmm. 2008, somewhere in there. The movie was good. Uh, didn't really. Stay Stay true to the book. I mean, you can say that about a lot of movies, really. But this one kind of missed the point of the the book, I thought. Um, so the book was written in 1988, and it, it takes place in the future, which in the book is 1997. Uh, so actually, what happens is nuclear war just destroys much of the world, uh, but Britain manages to survive. And uh, during the chaos, a, a fascist regime takes control of Britain. Um, the only challenge to the current regime is this guy named V. V is a very fucking weird dude who dresses up in a cape and a Guy Fox mask. He, he's obviously very strong, he's very fast, and he's obviously, obviously very smart as well. Um, he recruits this young lady by the name of Evie, which is something that happens in the movie as well. Uh, you can kind of say that he holds her captive, but to me it seemed like she stayed there by her own will. Stockholm um, Syndrome. Yeah, a little bit of that. Like when uh, Laura got raped by Luke in General Hospital, it was okay after. <laughs> it was they got married. Like they got married eventually. Or like Sissy and Uncle Joey. Uh, 
So anyway, Evie is kind of like, um, kind of like in training under V's wing. Uh, she she's staying at V's palace. Well, not a palace. It's he calls it the Shadow Gallery. It's basically his home, but it's a huge mansion filled with old relics and things that would be considered illegal by the current regime. Basically, if you were caught with any of these things, you'd probably be put to death. But V has them, he flaunts them, he's proud of them, and he, he believes that, you know, that art should be a part of life, whereas the current regime that's under uh, that's controlling Britain right now is not about any of that. They rule by being powerful and asserting their dominance over the people. Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, so through the story, you learn that V is uh, the, a product of scientific testing per, that is performed by the current regime earlier in the, earlier in the story. Um, so what V is doing, what V does throughout the the book is he basically eliminates anyone who's connected with any sort of the scientific testing, basically anyone who could uh, identify him, and he's also uh, vowing to bring down the entire fascist government and create anar anarchy by showing the people of London that they have a voice and that you know together they can overpower their fascist rulers. Uh, v V's mission basically leads to his death. He, he eventually gets caught. He gets shot. And he dies. I mean, he he is a mortal man. Um, but his grooming of Evie pays off in the end because she, in the book, which th this does not happen in the movie, she actually assumes the role of V at the end of the story, and the people of London are sp are inspired by how strong V is, and uh, you can see them starting to build a new world. As in the in the book, again, it's not Parliament that's blown up; it's um, it's some other government house, but it's not it's not the Houses of Parliament like it is in the movie. I can't remember what it's called, like sixteen hundred. Harding Street, or it's some sort of famous mansion in Britain. I can't remember what the Buckingham Palace. No, it's not Buckingham Palace. <laughs> I would know that. <laughs> anyway, so so Evie gives him a Viking funeral. As he as he's blown up, he's he's also crumbling uh, a, a form of the government, and the people are very inspired by that. They see that V is still alive. But it, it's just a really cool book, and it's it's very inspiring as well. It's awesome. Uh, number two on my list is Ready Player One. Uh, basically, a fiction about the future. Uh, video games are just uh, high in technology. You uh, basically wear some kind of helmet and you get transported to another world where you interact with games. Uh, this story is about... Uh, the person who created this world that everyone goes to when they jack into the system eventually dies. I can't remember his name because Brad still has my book. But um, he uh, he dies and leaves this huge treasure map on where to find like the ultimate power and all these riches. I believe he whoever finds this, whoever completes and solves this treasure map gets to be the uh, gets all of this guy's money and head of the company. Uh, it takes you through uh, this one uh, lowly character who doesn't know. He, he's smart, but he's not an elite. Uh, there's tons of elites in this whole whole book, uh, elite gamers, and he just has uh, like the most rundown type of equipment. And he eventually becomes uh, able to start solving these puzzles and uh, getting closer to the um, to the prize and. Once uh, he starts solving it, everyone who's uh, an elite and part of this evil corporation try to take him down and try to beat him to the prize. He eventually um, ends up getting a perfect score in Pac-Man uh, while in this uh, game world, which is pretty cool. Uh, just an awesome book, uh, fast read, and it's very fun. Do you remember the, the elite, the, the bad guys' fashions, the group, what they're called? No. The Sixers? Oh, were they? Because they had, they all had ID numbers instead of names. Oh, that's right. And do you remember what the lead Sixers number was? No. -uh. Six double five three two one. Oh. From a Clockwork Orange. That's Alexander Delarge. Oh, is it? Uh, uh, prison number. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, the, I, I I saw that. I was like, oh, that's heck of tight. They put that in there. No, I didn't. I didn't catch that. I didn't put that on my list because it more geared towards Atari people. Because it referenced a bunch of Atari stuff. I uh, did it. Yeah, like I probably adventure just, and I probably just ignored it. Yeah. Uh, m number two on my list list is gonna have to be the Thieves of Always mm -hmm. by Clive Barker. Um, 
basically this kid named Harvey Swick is bored with his life. The book opens up, uh, I think the opening line is something like the great gray beast of February is eating Harvey alive or whatever. And it's a metaphor of how he's so bored and wants more from his life. Uh, this being known as Rictus shows up and takes him to a holiday house, vacation house for all you U- U.S. people. A stupid holiday. I hear I when people say, oh, I'm, a ho- I'm, I'm going on a holiday. I'm on holiday. He <laughs> <laughs> sounded like Russell Brand. I'm going to jack off on a biscuit and drink some tea. <laughs> <laughs> um. And then eat my biscuit. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> Basically, at the Holiday House, you could wish for anything you want. You experience all four seasons there in one year. Christmas happens every day, and you could leave whenever you like. Or can you? Oh man, can you? It's a great book. Yeah, it is. It's really good. I remember read. I read it a few times. It's a it's supposed to be geared towards children, but it's still a great book. It's really fun to read. I'm hoping they make a movie out of it. Uh, if they haven't made one by now, <laughs> it was one made what in the nineties, ninety one or something. Like eighties. Oh man, yeah. Here's hoping. <laughs> uh, so my number two is Dune by Frank Herbert. It's a science fiction book. Pro, I, in fact, I know that it is the longest book that I've ever read. I have uh, something to admit. I'm not a very fast reader, mm. so it takes me a very long time to read books. As much as I like reading, I don't do a lot of it just because it takes me so long to get through a book. But I stuck with Dune, and I, it was really, really good. Uh, so Dune takes place in the very distant future. Humans have spread out and colonized, colonized planets throughout the universe. Um, the focus is mainly uh, on the battle for this thing called Melange, or Melange. You don't know how to pronounce it. It's a book. <laughs> uh, basically, the melange is a uh, is a drug, but most people know it as the spice. So whenever they refer to the spice, they're referring to this drug called melange. It's a drug that's uh, very popular with the upper class, very valuable. And what happens is uh, there there are two houses that exist in in this book. It's called the House of Atreides and the Harkonnens, and they ba- basically battle for the spice which is very, um, there's a, there's, they have a lot of it on this planet called Arrakis. Arrakis is a desert planet. Uh, there are sandworms yes. around everywhere, and they actually attribute the, uh, the existence of the spice on this planet to the sandworms. Like the sandworms play some sort of role in, how, in the, uh, the creation of the spice. It's their shit. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, the main character is this kid named Paul. He is uh, born with special powers, and he uh, he's, he trains under the Bene Gesserit, which is basically a school of witches. Uh, one of the things that's cool about this is it's a science fiction book, but they're actually acknowledging the pre- presence of magic, which is, I mean, you think of Star Wars, yeah, they do like kind of like the same thing, but this was before Star Wars, where everything science fiction was always supposed to be advanced technology, um, not a whole lot of mythological uh, things going along going on but this kid actually did have some sort of you know mystical abilities which was pretty cool um so the natives on the planet of arrakis are are known as the freemen the freemen realize that paul has a special gift and recruits him and his mother jessica into their tribe they refer to paul as muad'dib of which muad'dib are these mice that are on the planet again some sort of um ancient ritual that they have to do with the mice where they hold mice in very high regard. So they call Paul Muad'Dib, which is a very high honor. Uh, it basically symbolizes that Paul is more than a leader, but something more like a religious prophet. Uh, Paul teaches the natives the fighting style of the Bene Gesserit, the school that he belongs to. The Harkonnen, who had inhabited the Arrakis, the, the desert planet, then get a visit from the freemen who basically kick their ass hmm. because they have this new... Uh, style of uh, fighting, the Bene Gesserit style, and also because, you know, they're on their planet and they're used to the conditions. Even though their numbers are a few, they're able to uh, outpower the, the Harkonnen uh, army. So at the end of the story, uh, Paul demands that the Harkonnen Emperor step down and that he be allowed to marry the Emperor's daughter, which would make Paul the uh, the Emperor of the Harkonnen people. And that's eventually what does happen. I mean, there's a whole lot of other shit that happens. It's a 700-page book. Uh, but that's the, the that's the end story that Paul basically takes over the Harkonnen people. He's also known as a as a religious leader of the uh, the, the people on uh, Arrakis, the Freemen. 
So there's a lot of shit going on, a lot of symbolism, as there is in any sort of science fiction book. You could argue that, you know, the Freemen are basically Native Americans, and everyone else is, you know, people who are fighting over America and the resources that America has available. It's, it's a really cool book, because like I said, there's a, lot, there's, a, there's a ton of symbolism, but there's also a really cool story that's going on to go with it, so that's my number two is doing. I tried reading that book. Uh, I picked it up at Aaron's house when I had to go to the bathroom. Yeah, so uh, I went in the bathroom and I opened it and I saw that the main character's name was Paul and I was like, moving on. <laughs> yeah, you gave up a little too soon. Yeah, I did. It's a really cool book. I was like, man, this is a stupid name to have as a main character because Paul, I mean, <laughs> it's not that great, but um, I, I think I was just a little young, but I'd check it out. It sounds pretty cool. There are I think there's like five or six sequels to it too. Mm-hmm. So I, I've only read Dune. Like I said, it takes me a long time to read all the books. A, a long story. So maybe at some point in my life, when I have more time, I might get, sit sit down and read the the, the sequels that mm-hmm. come after Dune. But right now, I just don't have time. Have you seen the movie? You know, it's not very good. Okay, <laughs> that's what I heard. I tried to watch it. And I I fell asleep and I tried to watch it again. And I fell asleep again. <laughs> I has I think David Bowie's in it, if I remember correctly. Oh man, he, he's some sort. Of, it, it's very eighties. It's not made very well. Mm. <laughs> All right, uh, number one on my list is the dictionary. Moving on. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it by Stephen King. Uh, it's my number one as well. Yeah, it's that's. We actually read that in eighth grade. We saw it in our school library. We we're like, man, I think it was about twelve hundred pages or something. And of course, when we were young, we skipped through the boring parts because we were more fascinated with the killer clown than anything. So, like, whenever uh, Mike would start writing about his stories, I like because you could always tell they were different because they were italics instead of yeah the interludes mm-hmm. or whatever yeah the, yeah the the dairy interludes basically takes place in this uh, town called Derry, Maine, where most, or most if not all, Stephen King books takes place in Maine. But it t- uh, tells a tale of uh, seven children who get terrorized by this entity known as It, who uh, could take the form of your greatest fear. Uh, I guess most of the people are afraid of clowns. That's why it looks like a clown. Uh, Pennywise the Dancing Clown or Bob Gray giant spider werewolf it's got it all in there it's awesome a bum with leprosy <coughs> wanting to suck your dick yeah <laughs> give you a blow job for some lobster <laughs> it's a crazy book it's i read it as an adult and it i was like why did our mom let us read this because there's so much like perverted stuff going on <laughs> like two dudes jacking it or something in the field and Beverly Marsh gets a train pulled on yeah, her. Yeah, it goes into detail on who she, <laughs> when she and this is when she's a kid, like twelve. They oh. before they leave after they confront it for the first time, they all run a train on her. I don't know why she wanted it to defy her dad. Is that is that why? I'm guessing so. Oh, I don't know. It was, it was her idea though. Yeah, she has slept with them all, and she was like, one of them was too big, and he ripped me. <laughs> Gross. Guess that's what happens when you're 12. <laughs> <laughs> you gonna ask Jordan if he ever? <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> afraid you're afraid of the answer. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, the one of the things that stuck out of my head when I read the book is the house on Nebolt Street, which yeah. was not put in the movie, mm. but that's like the first place they confronted it, and they they heard it. But then they went back to the sewers to finish the job Mm. because they didn't think it was it had perished. Um, Another interesting fact: Jonathan Brandis appeared in that movie, Mm. who also later appeared in Sidekicks with Chuck Norris. (laughs) And what that Sequest TV show? uh, DSV. Yeah, but then he later committed suicide, just like Andy Pilato. Oh my goodness. Because my wife had a crush on both of them. <laughs> it's getting pretty dark. Man, should we turn out the lights? <laughs> no, that's it. That's oh, okay. That's, that's as dark as it's going to go for now. Oh, for now. 
This is a holiday edition, right? <laughs> <laughs> the holiday special. All right, my number one is not a uh, not any sort of novel. It's not a, a piece of fiction. It's actually a strategy book. It's called Harrington on Hold'em. It's, it's written by Dan Harrington, and obviously it's about poker. And in terms of affecting, in terms of actually affecting my life, this book has probably done the most for me. Uh, it taught me about a variety of strategies to employ during a game of no one to hold them. It stresses the importance of position, image, and making pro- proper mathematical decisions. It also laid out how to calculate odds and when to and how to how much to actually bet or raise. Uh, of course, poker is not what you would call a solved game. In other words, it's not like a correct mathematical thing that you should do in any sort of situation. Uh, such as like blackjack or I guess baccarat's probably not a solid game either. Baccarat screwed down. blackjack. But blackjack, blackjack, there is a s- correct statistical play whenever in, in any sort of given situation. Poker's not like that. It's very much a, a person or a psychological game. But there is still a lot of math- mathematics involved. Um, I like that he uh, gave his advice in, in percentage ratios. He didn't say you should do this in this situation and do this in, in this situation. Uh, for example, he would say something like, you have ace-eight offsuit in the hijack position pre-flop in a nine-handed game where you have 20 big blinds. 60% of the time, it would be a good idea to go all in. About 35% of the time, it would be a good idea to just make it a standard raise. And another 5% of the time, it would be good just to fold your hand. So basically, he, he stressed that you, sh- you should change up your strategy. But, and he actually came up with a system for doing this it's something as simple as like having a wristwatch on and you can with a second hand so you can divide basically every 10 seconds into like a, a certain percentage so say so there's 60 seconds in a minute you could say you could just round up say say that uh, the first 10 seconds you should do this 20 percent of the time the next 10, 10 seconds you should do this 20 percent of the time so if anything is you should do something 40 percent of the time if it's between zero and 20 you should go ahead and take that action I don't, I don't, you, you know, I don't go into all that. I just kind of, when whenever I'm making my decisions, I just try to make it, try to make that sure to, 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 to change what, what I'm going to do in any given situation. It is important to do the better thing more often than the, the more offbeat type of thing, but I wouldn't go so far as to wearing a wristwatch, but I, I appreciated that he at least came up with that strategy. Um, the other thing I liked about the book a lot is that um, it was really easy to read for me. It was, it was really my first poker book that I had ever read. And it, it, it taught me so much in terms of how to calculate ratios, how to calculate percentages, how to calculate your, your implied odds and your actual odds. I, I'm not a math genius by any stretch, but just reading this book helped me to understand, uh, you know, how to make the appropriate play based on what I thought my opponent was holding. So I'm not a great poker player. It's just something that I do for fun. But if you're ever interested in getting better at poker, I would definitely recommend it. It's a really good read, and it's it's pretty easy to read. Again, a lot of pictures. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Pictures are tight. Yeah. <laughs> so that's my number one. Do you guys have any honorable mentions? Oh, man. No, I don't. I have a couple. I like you, Brad. Nope. Alright. So I wrote down another poker book. It's called The Professor, the Banker, and the Suicide King. It's a book by Michael Craig. It's actually a, a non-fiction piece of work. Uh, basically, he documents the games that occurred, uh, I believe it was in the late 90s, maybe early 2000s, uh, of this league of professional poker players, people that we would know, like Howard Letterer, Billy Brunson, uh, Phil Lundy, and they played against this guy by the name of Andy Beal. Very much an amateur player. He um, is a banker from Texas. But anyway, he, he's an insanely wealthy guy, more or less a amateur poker player. He picked up Limit Hold'em, which is what he always wanted to play. And he always wanted to play heads up against random poker pros. And they play for these insane stakes, like $50,000, $100,000 blind. The swings were just massive, like millions of dollars in any given hand. Uh, so it basically tracks you know, how much of an edge a professional poker player actually has over a billionaire, over any random person, really. 
And um, I think Andy Bill, the, the billionaire's strategy was that if you play high enough, it's going to affect the way that these guys play. They're going to talk about they're not going to do what they used to do because it's such a large amount of money. Eventually, the professionals got the best of them. They, they learned his strategy and they and they beat him. But it was an interesting story. And man, the amount of money that they were flying, that was flying around was just insane. Hmm. Um, another book that I uh, appreciated was this book called Catch Twenty Two. It's one of the probably one of the greatest books ever written. Are, have you read it? No. You read it? Uh, it's it's about this troop of soldiers in, during World War Two. Uh, it's it's kind of a satirical piece. It's you know you know what a catch twenty two is. But yeah, I hear that all the time. It's basically so, so so say something that has to happen in order for this other thing to happen, but this thing that has to happen can't possibly happen. So the 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 one that kind of sticks out to me when I think of this book, um, the catch twenty two is you ha if you're ruled to be insane. Then you cannot leave. You cannot fly any bombing mission. So that in, the, in the course of World War II, of course, there were a lot of bombing missions. And you have to perform so many bombing missions before you're allowed to go home. But if you're in a plane flying a bombing mission, you have to be insane. But if you say that you're insane, then you're clearly not insane mm -hmm. because you're sane enough to realize that you're insane. So you, but yeah. that, that, that's the catch twenty two. Yeah. It's a, it's a. It, there's a whole. The the, the author was. A, basically a genius. He, he came up with a whole bunch of different situations like this, and the characters were just so funny. It's, it's very good read. I'd highly recommend Catch-22 if you ever have a chance to read that. Uh, the Watchmen, another mm -hmm. Alan Moore book, very good. Uh, the Hobbit, like we mentioned before, another very good book. I prefer The Hobbit to The Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Um, and the one that I'm reading right now is, is a really good book. It's a documentary by Artie Lynn called Too Fat to Fish. Uh, I haven't quite finished it yet, but the stories that he tells about his various suicide attempts, he's had more than one, and uh, just his issues with drug addiction, it's fascinating, and uh, to me, Artie Lang is one of the funniest people alive, if not the funniest person alive, so the way that he tells stories just cracks me up, I would definitely recommend that. He has a new book out there also called Crash and Burn, I can read that when I'm done with that book. You know why I didn't like Word of the Rings? Because when, you know, when you, people talk, it's quotation marks, like in dialogue, like when in a, in a book, yeah. In Lord of the Rings, it's just a single quotation mark, <laughs> so that's why I stopped reading it. It makes hella sense. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they just use apostrophe. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's it was confusing, and it, I was little at the time, so I was like, "This is stupid." <laughs> <laughs> Ready for a round two top five? Oh yes. <sighs> This is a joke, right? You gotta do this shit, shit to me again. <laughs> What's it? What is it? Uh, um, top five video game moments. I don't recall this. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the emails. <laughs> All right. I thought there were only two top five. Okay, go ahead. I'll have to make something up or just pass it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, the number five on my list is. From Silent Hill 3, it's the haunted house oh. that you go through near the end of the game. It's just so creepy, and you have to walk through it, and there's different traps that could kill you, and it was just fun to go through. Uh, number five on my list was Silent Hill 2, when uh, you get into the uh, apartment building and you hear Pyramid Head dragging that huge sword behind him. You don't know where it's coming from until you see, finally see him. That's tight. I'm going to pass. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I, I want to think of it more before I come up to the top. Um, number four is Resident Evil 3, the nemesis. Uh, he pops out of everywhere, tries to scare the shit out of you. If you run from him and don't kill him, he can chase you to other rooms. And you'll hear the music when you make it, when you step through the room, you'll just hear that doom, and you know he's back there chasing after you. Can't get away from him. Uh, number four on my list is in Bioshock, when you descend into Rapture. Just the whole, you see the whole city underwater with all the animals floating by. It's very uh, awesome. And you, the, just the graphics on that is amazing. Number three on my list is going to have to be Castlevania Symphony of the Night, the reverse castle. Mm. You go through the whole giant castle one time, 
And then if you play the game just right, you get to go through it all again, but it's upside down. With different enemies and stuff. Yeah. Um, number three on my list. Uh, oh, when in uh, Legend of Zelda, uh, Link to the Past, when you enter the Dark World and you have to find out there's uh, a whole other uh, seven maidens you have to rescue along with Zelda. And it's just a horrible world to be in. All the enemies are hecka strong and the uh, dungeons are hard and creepy. Number two on my list is going to be from Super Metroid, the Mother Brain Battle. I've talked about it before on podcasts. It's just a great battle. Uh, number two on my list is in Chrono Trigger when uh, Frog picks up the Massive Moon and clears the entrance to Magus's castle uh, near the beginning of the game and he gets his bravery back. Number one on my list is going to have to be from Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword. It's finally assembling the Master Sword. Yeah, that's my number one as well. Uh, it's finally seeing that last uh, image of the Master Sword after it's complete. So that was a tight top five. <laughs> quick and <laughs> short and sweet. Um, so now we're going to go through some different types of stories here. We have a few topics. But first we're going to do a random favorite. Which I like to do sometimes, just off oh, the top man. of your head. Uh, so why don't we go over with your favorite gift given, and then your favorite gift received. Christmas? Yeah. yeah. Have to be Christmas gift? Any type. Oh, man. My favorite gift given was the, the ring that I gave to my wife. Awesome. <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> You know, when I proposed to her. Yeah. <laughs> How about the one you received? Oh, that was the blood job. I was going to say <laughs> that. <laughs> no, I was going to say that for you. Because <laughs> I, I was just going to, I was joking too. <laughs> That's like a funny how it's real. Uh, I actually don't know. I mean, it, it's supposed to be off the top of your head, so that's that's okay. Yeah. I do like blowjobs. Yeah. That one Who doesn't? That one was particularly passionate. <laughs> so, uh, my favorite gift given would have to be the Final Fantasy VI character beat art over there that Brandon has. Oh yeah. Or the Xbox 360 that I gave to my kids because they were not expecting that at all. Uh, received, I would have to say Earthbound uh, from Brandon, the Phazon Samus suit statue, or uh, the PlayStation 1 with SmackDown from my wife. She got your PlayStation 1 SmackDown? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, the gift received for me would have to be. Oh, man. Probably when I got the Wii and the Twilight Princess from Brad and my mom, because I wasn't expecting that at all. Uh, and the one given would probably be the Phase on Suit Samus, because Brad was really excited when he opened it up and uh, checked it out. Rest in peace, Samus. Did you hear about that? You remember that Samus statue Brad used to have? I think so, yeah. That lit up and everything? Uncle Ron was over his house cleaning one time and it got demolished. Oh, man. I, looked on, I always look on it for eBay. It goes for like 1500 bucks. Yeah, it's How much? 1500 I got it for him for 200 when it yeah, first came out. Oh, this was way before. Yeah. Get yeah. But uh, I got it for him when I saw it was coming out in like 2008 or nine. And uh, it was pre-ordered for 200 and there's only 1500 out there. So now whenever you try to find it, people are dicks about it and won't um, sell it for a low price. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about a little bit how we met uh, back in high school. Brad uh, and I met before high school. <laughs> <laughs> it's an episode of Sister, Sister. Brother, brother. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we, we each got adopted from different families that we met in high school. <laughs> that did not happen. Um, first, I, I one thing I did want to note is I met Aaron first. 
uh, and then I eventually met Nick through Brandon and Aaron, but I was in ninth grade, and in, uh, this one guy who ended up dying in a snowboarding accident, Mr. Goodrich, uh, he was a teacher. Don't know what he was doing on the slopes by himself, but that's a whole different story. Um, I was in that class, and Aaron sat next to me, and Lewis Butler sat behind me. And Lewis was kind of like, he wasn't like a dick, but he was kind of like one of those abrasive people who, like, you didn't know what they were going to say, so it was all nervous. And then Aaron's just sitting there like, yeah, man, this 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 guy is cool. And, and he was like, he was like basically the, the what saved me from Lewis Butler. <laughs> because whenever Lewis would start to say something that would irritate me or, like, off the wall, Aaron would put him in his place. Because Aaron, like, was a force to be reckoned with. <laughs> I remember when I switched classes with you, Lewis Butler uh, kept trying to call it out. Like, you're not Brad. You're not Brad. Did he know? Yeah. How do you know? I don't know. Probably because the way I was acting. Uh, and uh, and uh, Aaron found it funny, but we watched this movie called Man the Horse or whatever. A man, a man, a man who called horse, a man whose name's horse or whatever. Yeah, and he was being hanged by his nipples with hooks in him. Like, what the fuck do you guys watch in this class? <laughs> and uh, Lewis was a dick. Yeah, you, you said it right. He was a dick. Um, and then he he was in my Spanish class with Miss Alessio. And you know who else was in that class? Andy Pilato. <laughs> Rest in peace. <laughs> Andy was hecka cool. He was. Uh, and all the girls liked him and thought he was cute. And uh, they looked like Jonathan Brandis. I thought he looked like John Stamos, kind of. <laughs> he had nice hair. He had blue eyes. I think he had nipple piercings. Uh, you like knew in, the color of his eyes? I, huh? Dang, you were in love with him, huh? Uh, he, Andy Pilato. <laughs> uh, and he got nipple piercings, I think, in junior high. It was kind of weird. In but, junior high? Or junior year of high school. And the... Uh, First memory I had of Nick was his little battle with Mr. Racine. When Mr. Racine was talking about um, music or something. No, he had a Jimmy Page shirt or a Jimi Hendrix shirt. And Mr. Racine was like, do you even know who Jimi Hendrix is? <laughs> and he's like, yeah. And he's like, look up Castles in the Sand. I don't know the name of the song, whatever it was called. And listen to that. He's like, okay. <laughs> I can't remember who you sat by, but I sat next to, I think, I don't know if it was Sean Dillon and James Bonet, but that's who I hung out with. And I think Nick was actually in my English class, too, in Miss Dramay's class, because she was going off against your Injustice for All shirt, and, and she was like, we should listen to that CD, and I'm like, okay, because <laughs> we ended up switching teachers, I don't know why. Did she get fired? Is that why we switched? Yes. Who else is going to teach you? Because <laughs> Mr. Goodrich died. Oh, the, I, the, the year that we were I thought they switched oh, before God. that. No? Oh. Well, we, we switched to this mis, this racist teacher named Miss Drame. Because <laughs> <laughs> Aaron hated her, dude. Um, I guess she was, like, picking on Aaron, and Aaron said, geez, why do you have to be so racist? Because she was half black, half white. <laughs> And she was also the lead of Culture in the Mix Club. <laughs> and Aaron was just like, why did it be so racist against me? It was just hilarious. <laughs> I wonder if that's the reason he's so attracted to black girls. Oh, Maybe. man. I'm going to ask him next time I see him. She, didn't she go by another name? When, she got like divorced or something and then changed her name to some weird name. Maybe she went back to her maiden name. Hmm. I think she was like a junior high teacher like the previous year. Really? Did she <coughs> go to the high school like the year that we got there? I think he might have like been in her class in eighth grade and ninth grade or something like that. Like, Maybe. Had previous experience with her. Because we went to a different junior high. We went oh, to Rio okay. Tierra. Okay. The ghetto junior high. Oh man, why did we want to go there? We had to. No, because I remember given a choice in Main Avenue. They said if you want to go to Rio Tierra, go to this class if you want to go to Rio Linda. No, it was based on where the water thing is, the blue water tower. Uh -huh. If you lived on one side, you had to go to Rio Linda, and if you lived on the other side, you had to go to Rio uh, Tierra. I thought it was a choice. No. That school sucked until I got into the gate program. It was so ghetto, uh -huh. and I hated it, and then they were like, let's move you into the gifted program, because <laughs> whenever we 
I got an assignment. I finish it in five minutes, and the teacher would look at me like, "What are you doing?" There's this one guy there. I I forgot his name. It was like Jose or Joe or something. And I was sitting. We had groups, and I was sitting at his group, and he like would pretend to give blowjobs and move his tongue in his cheek and uh-huh. make it. And I was just like shaking my head, like, "What? Why the fuck am I in here? <laughs> I hated it." And me and Brandon didn't have any classes together not yeah. until we got to the gate program. Yeah, when we got in gate, all of our classes were the same. That was hecka tight. I don't really have a whole lot of stories in terms of how we met. I don't, really don't remember how we met. Yeah, uh, I remember. I remember always walking across that baseball field and seeing you guys. I don't remember really walking with you guys until like, like maybe my sophomore year. Or so I think Ken was part of the glue too. Ken and Aaron, and I uh, used to walk with Mike, right? Mike Bunton. Thun, th- uh, Thornburg. Oh, ne- yeah, maybe at that time. That's about when we started going my separate ways. Yeah. And he became a jock and I became a nerd. And, and Ken became, I don't know what he, he became, like king of the lunch being. bunch. Man, like, uh, I, 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 I hung out with him in ninth grade a ton and then 10th grade it kind of started to dwindle and I think he went more towards the drama side, like with, you know, the David Pitcher and the Jamie Naylor and uh, that that crew. And I think the lunch bunch just disbanded and um it just got weird the lunch bunch was a group of like 20 nerds who like wanted to show let their freak flag fly proudly and it was just a real funny group of kids i always remember getting um i can't remember her name um alvarez diana alvarez she always gave me her gardettos yeah. It was like a tire. I think we both used to like Diana Alvarez, too. Maybe. She was like a really skinny god with a big head. Right? Yeah. And the giant hair, like <laughs> like Brave. This will do it for episode 33 of Treasure Hunting for Nostalgia. This is Brandon. This is Brad. This is Nick.